business with a servant's heart. Servant's heart. Welcome to the podcast. Inspiration, motivation, take servant's heart. Listen to the podcast. We're all about to talk about life. Our guests will share their life story. We want you to success in life and business. We're ready and we will start shortly. We're gonna talk about life, we're going to speak on business You're gonna shine bright, we are going to witness Business with a servant's heart, servant's heart. With hosts Steve Ramon and Ray Ramona. Inspiration, education, talks servant's heart. Listen to the podcast Steve Ramona. Brainshare Business Mentors proudly presents Brainshare.us, the ultimate business education platform, delivering the proven systems, processes, tools, and knowledge that empower you to build the business of your dreams. With 13 high-powered courses encompassing over 240 lessons accessed online on your schedule. Running a business is the hardest thing you'll ever do. We've helped thousands of business owners gain the leadership, communication, and business skills needed to build the business of their dreams. We can help you. Choose your learning path. Scuba Squad is the premier membership program for today's business leaders with access to all Brainshare material and double our money-back guarantee. Brainshare Basics, the ultimate business framework course, a hard-hitting 13-week program to lay the necessary foundation to build the business of your dreams or take individual courses as you need them. Every course has dozens of lessons with video, practical exercises, precise documentation, and the opportunity for direct feedback from a Brainshare mentor. All programs have our exclusive 30-day money-back guarantee. No questions asked, don't wait. Choose your path and start today. Welcome everyone to Doing Business with a Servant's Heart podcast. Doing business and life with a purpose, or a why, serving others, yes, and achieving success. I'm your host, Steve Ramona. We created this show for you because we want everyone to be motivated, inspired, and educated to make an impact in your world. I always say start your world, and then the bigger world will get better. We all just got to take care of ourselves first. As you listen to my awesome guest, as I'm talking to him in the green room, I want you to think about how will you serve today? and what impact you'll create today with that service. So you have a little bit of homework. If you want to reach back out to me, I'd love to hear it. I want to thank my two sponsors, Brainshare.us, Drive Business Success and Sustainability with Brainshare Business Mentors, where your business flourishes and your vision comes to life. Check out the link in the show notes. And then pitchdb.com. Be a guest on over 3 million podcasts, speak at over 11,000 conferences, and much, much more. Build your thought leader platform with incredible opportunity to show who you really are. With that being said, as I told you, I have an awesome guest today. We're going to dive into a subject sexuality that we just laughed before in the green room. Like uh, some people are really serious when they talk about sex and sexuality. My guest is so informed, but you're going to have a lot of fun listening to him. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the invite. I appreciate the opportunity to to be part of your world for at least 25 minutes or so. You bet. 350 shows, you're my first sexuality show. So I'm pretty pumped up because I like to be diverse and unique. Let's jump into it. And you specifically work with men and sexuality and how that affects our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, what I would love to explore with you today, what I want to try to facilitate is a conversation between you and I where we... Yeah, when we look at what is sexual health, what is sexual well-being, um, I find that in my experience uh, as a sexologist uh, and as someone who's continually learning about human sexuality that, well, as you, as, as you and I were talking in the green room, it's something that people take either very seriously or don't really want to talk much about at all. Um, and in my experience with men, of course, as certainly being as a young man, is we like to talk about our sexual conquests and how how great we are, and you know the ego drives a lot of that stuff. Yep. Um, and I, I imagine that what I what I first want to do is is sort of like put a definition around what is sexual health and and what is sexual well being, and I'll and I'll pitch that question right at you. I'd love to hear what you think sexual health is. Just sexual health. What is sexual health to you? 
I, I, you know, thank you for asking me a question. I think it's, it's, it's something that's part of us that we can't shy away from, but like fitness, health, emotional health, it's all got to be, um, uh, not, it has to be, uh, I'm coming from the fitness background, practiced, worked on mm -hmm. daily, mm -hmm. yep. monthly, yearly. In the it, momentarily, I would even suggest. Yeah. And and do you think that I mean, I, and again, it's just to explore. So there's sexual yeah. health and then sexual well being. Sexual well being. Do you think there's a difference between sexual well being and sexual health? Oh, absolutely. I think the well being is you're moving towards that journey of being a better person, being a better person to mm -hmm. other people because you're. I don't say indoor. I don't know what that, but dope, whatever that is, because I, I think sexuality. Is it missing just like loneliness during COVID? We saw a lot of uh, isolation. I think when you're lacking the sexuality, you're not a full person. I think it's a part of you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And and I and I do think that it's interesting that if I asked, you know, five other people for their definitions of sexual health and sexual well-being, I'd probably get, you know, five different answers. Um, and I think this has been one of the one of the things that's been made that's makes that makes potentially this conversation challenging. We have our we have our own sort of moral and societal views around talking about sexuality. Um, and I think that that really is an umbrella that covers all of us in terms of our uncomfortableness or our unwillingness to talk about uh, sex and sexuality. And I do think that the, you know, that men in particular uh, are struggling with being able to talk about their sexuality, mm -hmm. talk about what is sexual health? What is sexual well-being? Now, I want to tell you a little story. So a few weeks ago, I, I uh, was flipping through a TikTok. My teenage daughter, you know, got me hooked. I got to admit it. Um, and uh, I, I found a, a, a dude who was promoting, basically promoting himself as like a nine-figure, uh, super wealthy, super successful guy. Come join me and maybe I'll fund your project. So I thought, okay, maybe this guy will help me publish a book that I'm working on, right? Maybe he'll maybe he'll be a backer of, of the project that I'm working on around around men's sexual health and sexuality. So I listen, I go on his thing and I listen to his spiel, and he's showing us pictures of him with movie stars and celebrities and athletes and uh, you know business professionals, and he's touting himself. There's a lot of talk about himself, and 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 during this first day's uh, conversation, like you know, I, I watched him kind of do his thing with other people in terms of his interaction with other guests because it was not just me; it was me and probably about twenty or thirty other people. At the end of that session, they invited me to come back the next day, as I as I'm sure they did with everyone else on the podcast or, or on the on the recording or whatever it was. Um, and I come back the next day, and I because I knew the process, I I raised my hand really quickly, and he chose me to speak first. He chose me to he chose me to talk with him first, and and I asked him. I said, "Listen, can I ask you a few questions?" And he sort of was like, "Okay." I could tell he was already a little, you know, "Why are you asking me questions?" Position. I said, "How's your sexual health?" And this. Yeah, this guy, this guy, his reaction was jaw open, like, what are you asking me? He immediately thought I was asking about his sex life, right? So he immediately had to go into, you know, describing what a great, what a great lover he was. And 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 I said, listen, man, you know, the whole point of me asking this question is because is your your reaction is kind of exactly my point. Like, I'm not asking you about your sex life. And and it's amazing to me that that you find it so almost offensive or completely out of the blue that I would ask you this question. If I had asked you how your health was, like, are you healthy? I imagine you would have had a very calm response. But as soon as I throw in the word sexuality, all kinds of bells and whistles go off, flags start waving. Yeah. And I, I imagine he thought that I was potentially trying to criticize him or embarrass him. And, and I said, listen, no, I'm writing a book about men's health and sexuality and uh, men, men's sexual health and men's sexual well-being. And I'm looking to you as maybe someone who's a backer. And of course, he was like, oh, you can self-publish. You don't need my money. But he, he was clearly very offended. Or, or, or at least shook up that I that I asked him this question, so much so that even after he was done speaking with me, the next two or three people he spoke to, he brought up sexual health, and, and, and he brought it up, but in a, in a roundabout sort of criticism way that I, how dare I bring this up? And I thought, okay, well this this guy is is another motivator for me to want to continue to do what I'm doing, which is to simply have this discussion, right? And ask these questions, like what. What is sexual health? What is sexual well-being, especially for us as men, right? Yeah. Um, the Me Too movement, it, it, you know, the Me Too movement is, I imagine, a direct result of a lot of um, men's misbehavior, ill behavior. Um, and I think part of that has to do with 
again, we have sort of moral compasses that that take us down certain roads. But because there's such a reluctance for, for people in general, and men in particular, to talk about sexual well-being and sexual health, I'm not sure that that men really know what what the what those words mean, man. Right? Yeah. So so for I want to I want to talk a little bit about something that I read. I read I read this incredible. There are these writers from England, and they wrote an article called "What is Sexual Well-Being, and Why Does It Matter for Public Health?" Now these are folks who who work more in in the sexual health field from a from a medical standpoint, right? So uh, these are these are folks who are trying to influence um, public health from the standpoint of when you go to see a doctor, when was the last time uh, your doctor asked you how your sexual health was, right? Um, I I, uh, I have a, a certification in problem sexual behaviors, and I took the certification with a lot of therapists who are becoming sex therapists. And the reason that a therapist has to become a sex therapist is because even in their schooling as becoming therapists, they don't talk about sexuality. Hmm. In medical school too, they don't talk hmm. about human sexuality. So there, there's a big gap between um, you know, medical knowledge and science knowledge, scientific knowledge, and our ability to talk about this topic. And I said to this to you in the green room too, like what is more universally human than sex and sexuality? I mean, none, none of us would be here if it wasn't for our parents engaging in this act that we're not really supposed to talk about. So I, I find this whole I find this whole premise really like laugh, laughably ironic, right? A little bit. Yeah, you you got my antennas up. And, and a question, quick question I have for you is: yeah. Does the conversation change now? This was in a group of people when you talked to this guy that wanted to. It was a group of people. Now, does yeah. the conversation change if it's just me and you, where it's there's no group? Well, you know, I think I imagine that maybe it's easier for you to be vulnerable, and maybe you'd be maybe you'd be easier to open up if yeah. if it's just you and me. And 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 I listen. I, I I'm not trying to suggest that I didn't catch this guy off guard. The last yeah. question I thought I was going to ask him was, "How's your sexual health?" Right. So <laughs> yeah. I take full credit for for throwing them off balance. Clearly, but that wasn't really my intent. My intent was to simply. I actually expected him to respond with, "What do you mean?" or like be curious about what it was that I was asking him. Um, his defensive posture was unexpected even for me. Yeah. So, so there are these English writers and they wrote this article and, and they, they talk about sexual health and sexual well-being and sexual justice and sexual pleasure as four pillars, so to speak, of mm. how um, doctors uh, and, and the medical community can talk to people, men and women, about sexuality. Right. Um, and, and that sexual health and sexual well-being are two parts of this four four post stool, if you will. Um, and I think that what they're talking about is really, really interesting because they're putting definitions around, OK, we're going to define sexual health more as like clinical. Right. You go and you get tested. Um, you know, we're really, really fortunate that here in the United States, that getting tested for STIs, for sexually transmitted diseases and infections is relatively inexpensive and in some cases free. Um, and it's and they're and it's readily available. We can go into any town and there are going to be a clinic or a place that we can go to get tested. I have friends in liberal Europe, and I found it very interesting when I spoke with these people from Germany, from Italy, from from uh, from Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like in, as Americans, we get fed a, a line that Europe is super liberal, the the medical, uh, you know, they get free access to everything and all. When I started talking to my friends about getting tested, for SDIs and, and, and sexually transmitted diseases, it's not it, it's not as easy in Europe as it is here. Like one of the things mm. that, yeah, exactly. This is my That's reaction. I thought for sure you'd be able to walk into any free clinic in Germany or in Italy or any European country and easily get tested. And they said, no, actually, it's not easy to get tested. It's not always free. And there's a lot of moral judgments by the doctors who, you, if you go into one of these places, they're going to question, why are you here? Why are you getting these tests? I found that to be really interesting and, and and actually made me feel better about even though, you know, we live in a in a pretty um, conservative uh, society in terms of our ability to talk about sexuality, that at least we we the promotion of getting tested from a health perspective is easily accessed for us as Americans. Yeah. Right. And it's interesting, too, that you say that. So now in Europe, people will be afraid to go see a doctor because they're going to be reprimands, not the right word, but they're going to have this negative so you know what? I'm going to deal with it on my own, which leads to more problems health-wise, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, interesting. And, and, and a reluctance to, to even go in and get tested in the first place. I mean, 
here in New York City, or, or I live, I can go and I get tested every day, monthly. I mean, as frequently as I want, without question. Um, and and again, part of that is the is the cost, which in some cases is free. And and another and and certainly, I don't ever fear being questioned or judged by the doctors in the office. And I know that my experience might be different. Other people may have had those experiences here, right? Um, but by and large, I was really surprised that in Europe, where yeah. everyone's so liberal and open minded, that this was a, that this was a bigger a bigger issue. So so I like I like uh, this 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 article that I sort of referencing with these uh, sexual justice, sexual pleasure, sexual health, sexual being. So that's an interesting sort of approach to talking about uh, human sexuality and, and human uh, well sexual health and sexual well being. And then to me, there's a practical part, right? When, when I talk with men, and I imagine you'll agree with me, we like to fix stuff, right? We want something to do. Theory is great, but we are practical. We want to be able to do things. Um, and there is a therapist by the name of Doug Harvey Braun, who developed what he calls the six principles of sexual health. And I love these six principles because it does give us as men and as people in general, a gauge. We can look at these principles and see to ourselves, how healthy am I being? It's almost like self-diagnosis. Yeah. Okay? And the six principles are pretty straightforward. And I don't think any of them will be surprising to you. The first one is consent, right? Getting consent. You can't really be healthy sexually or in a sexual situation unless everyone involved has given their consent and hopefully enthusiastic consent. Yeah. Right. Number two is non-exploitive. Like you can't be in a healthy sexual situation if someone is being exploited, you know, in that situation. You can't be healthy sexually if you're not being honest. Honest is the third principle. And without honesty, uh, and, and honesty is sort of linked to all of the other principles because exploitation, consent, all of this is sort of revolves hinge, hinges on honesty. Shared values. Shared values is one that I think a lot of people practically overlook. Uh, if you're with someone who, who who you're really excited about being with, you just want to be with them and you're not maybe asking the question of what do you like? Because maybe what you like is totally different than what I like and our values are not shared. And so when we end up in the other room, we find ourselves with, in very different positions because we haven't talked about what I value and what you value. And do we yeah. share the same values, right? Interesting. Huh? The fifth one is protection. So protecting yourself from disease, from STIs, uh, sexually transmitted infections, uh, diseases from unwanted pregnancy. Uh, this protection piece, again, uh, falls usually on the men uh, in many ways. And, and women, you know, the pill is great for women, but when it comes to sexually transmitted uh, infections, you know, wearing a condom, that's going to be more effective than not. And and I I have I am the first one to say that as a man, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of condoms because of the way they feel or the yeah. lack of feeling. But from a practical protection standpoint, they're pretty required. Yeah. And then the last piece, the sixth principle of sexual health is pleasure. Which, again, is something that we shy away from. I think pleasure in general in, in the United States is, you know, we get a lot of entertainment and we're allowed to entertain ourselves and the discussion around pleasure, like finding pleasure in anything is something we don't talk about much in general, but sexual pleasure, again, makes people awkward or makes people feel uncomfortable. Sexual pleasure, I mean, biology is pretty smart. It, biology, biology has made sex feel good. That's that allows us to continue our species. If it if it if it felt like sandpaper, none of us would do it. We we would have gone extinct a long time ago. Right? Exactly. Right. Right. That that's so interesting because it's like drinking water. You got to drink water for us to grow as a you know as a community and as a world. We you know this is a part of life. It's not like this outlier going. Hey, let's bring this in. No, it's been part of life. You know, a question I have. This is so great. Jesse, such a great conversation. Social media, and you mentioned TikTok. When I jumped on TikTok for the first time, seven, all I saw was sexual stuff. Girls showing their booties and shaking and, you know, and I don't know, I don't get involved with TikTok. I do promote some stuff, but how has that changed sexuality and sexual health from 20 years ago? I'm 62, I might say your age, but I think we're close to age. You know, when we're in high school, we didn't see this, what people are seeing now in high school and college. Well, so you raise a really good point. I'm 54 years old and, uh, you know, sex education, I think broadly speaking, is one of the one of the motivators of me even talking to you or talking about any of this stuff, because I think 
we lack a lot of sex education and I and and I'm sure this won't I, I'm not the first person to say and I'm sure you've heard this before yeah kids are looking at porn as sex ed and that's not healthy that I mean that's not great that's not a good gauge to determine uh if you're being sexually healthy or not and and the way people interact I mean Porn is pretend, it, and people think that it isn't. And and yeah, access to that is is widely consumed by young people and people our age. And and for those young people, though, if there isn't more formal sex education uh, given to them in their upbringing, and 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 I again was raised in the seventies and eighties in the U.S. I don't remember. I'm sure I had a sex ed class once or twice. And and the saying goes, it's usually the PE teacher who comes in and like reluctantly <laughs> and awkwardly talks about like rolling the condom on the banana or something. And it's horrible. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah, no one learned. No one really knows. No, right. I mean, so I, I appreciate you for raising that point because access to sexualized content is widely available. Access to actual like healthy approaches to sex and sexuality or having or even being able to just talk about this where do you find that and and that's part of why i'm here i, I feel like my service at this point in my life is to is to facilitate or encourage the facilitation of these conversations to make us a little less uh, it, icked by this conversation and and a little more accepting of of you know sexuality is normal and sexuality is okay and you know, trying to put the put the moral judgments on pause for a moment, just so that we can get through and just talk about some of the more practical sort of biological uh, imperatives, right? Just to yeah. be oh, to take care of our bodies, right? And understand our bodies. I and mean, we're in our bodies for for some number of years. So like, it would be great if we understood how they worked and how they worked with other people. And, and since the mechanics of sexuality lead us to have children and continue our, our crazy species, I, I, I find it really ironic that we don't know more about ourselves from a sexual standpoint, you know? Yeah, especially, and I'm glad you write, because porn addiction, I know a number of guys, I, I met a gentleman in the church that goes around the world talking about porn addiction. He had porn addiction, and mm -hmm. we had a nice extensive 10 minute conversation about it. I learned some stuff, you know? Uh, I, you know, I've looked at it, and, I, and I'm not going to speak for you. I, yeah, I'm going to probably say that. But it's not the same. It's like money can do two things. Money can be really good for you or money can be really bad for you. I think sexuality and sex is the same way. And we don't talk about money the same either. Like we don't talk about sex, right? You know, that's another, you know, tab money. another taboo topic, money and sex. Oh. Exactly, right? It's So what's your, your goal um, with people, with men? Because you work with men. And, and let me jump back a little bit. So you work with men. Why don't you work with women? I know there's a great answer to that, but I'd love to hear it. So I work with anyone who's struggling with okay. uh, sexual behavior, right? So let me be clear. I work with anyone who struggles with great. sexual behavior. Um, uh, twice a week, I have a one hour uh, free access um, facilitated conversation to ask the question, what is sexual health and sexual well-being? So twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I offer a one hour, anyone can join, and I just facilitate this conversation. Because a lot of people don't know the answers to these questions. Or they everyone, like I said, we get 10 different answers from 10 different people. So that's sort of where that's sort of where I begin with come, let's just talk about this. And if you feel compelled after these conversations, after these group discussions, after these group facilitated uh, question and answer, I have a six-week online course that goes into looking at each of the six principles of sexual health as I described them that uh, Doug Harvey Braun developed, right? So we spend a week talk, one, one two hour session, it's two hours a week uh, for six weeks. So in the first session, we talk about consent. Then we, in the second one, we talk about non-exploitation. We talk about honesty. We talk about shared values, protection, and pleasure. And each of these sessions is two hours. And, and it's really just a facilitated conversation so that we can just get over our awkwardness and our reluctance to talk about this and just normalize these conversations a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah. 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 yeah and it's interesting as you're talking, this is so good. This is so good, Jesse. You know, I'm thinking as a child or high school or college, when you're rebooked by a woman who didn't want to have sex with you, you don't tell your friends or family because your ego drops and then you're not sexual and then you come alone and then you become isolated because you hear all these grant because us men talk about our great stories or our great epic sexual conquests. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. How 
how is that play in? And that's, and it sounds like there's a bridge to your fitness health and your wellness when your sexual health is not good. Does it spill over on the others? Of course. Well, I mean, yeah. sexual health is mental health and physical yeah. health, right? Sexual mm -hmm. health really embodies both the body and the mind. Yeah. And again, there's nothing that's more universally human than our sexuality. It's how we continue the species. And it's something that, that we're biologically driven to do in many cases, right? There are some people who aren't. I, I want to give props to the, to the uh, asexual people out there. There are a few. Um, yeah. And people struggle with, with their sexual behaviors, right? They become obsessive. They become compulsive. They act out in certain ways and they may use sex and sexuality. I know I did for many years to fill an emotional hole that really had nothing to do with sex or sexuality. Um, so, you know, there, there, that's a, that's a minefield of discussion that we could get into. And we don't have a lot of time to do that yeah. here, but the whole point is, again, is to start to deconstruct some of the preconceived notions we have about just talking about this stuff, you know, um, the, the having, being a child of the seventies and the free love movement, all that stuff, like that's groovy. That's great. <laughs> And, and 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 in that time, sex and sexuality was talked about, you know, there was a book, Where Did I Come From? And there was a lot of introductory stuff for kids. And like, I I was part of all of that. There were a few things that weren't talked about. There, there weren't. I mean, as, as liberal and as open as we were in talking about that stuff 50 years ago, 40 years ago, I think we've taken a few steps back. And I think what was lost during that time too was really, was really saying, hey, free love is great. And maybe there's some things you should think about, right? Consent, is everyone involved, happy to be here? Is there, is anyone being exploited here? Are we being honest with each other about our past experiences? Are we being honest with each other about what we like and what, do we share the same values? Do we want, yeah. like, you know, do we want the same stuff? Um, are we protecting ourselves from, from infections and from unwanted pregnancies? And are we having fun? Is it pleasurable? None of these, none of these were, none of this stuff was talked about. No, was, no. At least not in my experience. No, in my experience too. So a couple of things that come to my mind is you hear a sexless marriage. Mm. That's not, that's um, a, a negative situation, right? That's where the sexual health is, right? You can come in or you or whoever and make it more a, a non-sexless marriage. It's going to improve the marriage, right? Well, I mean, again, I would suggest to you that your sexual health and well-being is is going to be connected to your mental health and physical health in some fashion. Yeah. So if there is a sexless marriage, there's probably deeper questions that need to be addressed yeah. than why are we not having sex? I, I think the answers to those questions might be tied to either physical health or mental health of, of, of either person involved or any person involved, right? Um, I, I don't think that a sexless marriage uh, happens out of, in a vacuum right there's definitely reasons that that, that ends up happening and uh, my guess is is that yeah it's going to be tied to either a physical limitation or physical health or some mental uh, uh i don't want to say mental health issue but some sort of thinking that prevents us from connecting in a sexual way well, and that's the lightning bolt too if you go to a therapist say hey, you know it, it, it can it can answer a lot of questions it sounds like you know mentally physically that can be answered that's the power of sexuality I'm hearing from you. It can well, really I, help us. I think it can. I I, I yeah. want to believe that that if if we could if we make it a, we make a lot of our own problems around sexuality. We we make our own, we make things uncomfortable for ourselves. And and there's a lot behind that. Again, there's a lot to unpack there. But I do I do think I, I appreciate you for saying that. I. I I believe that if we were more comfortable talking about this more openly mm -hmm. between men, between men and women, yeah. that, yeah, that maybe some of the behaviors that we find ourselves doing, that maybe those would change. Um, you know, men get a bad rap because there's a lot of men who behave in a certain way. And I was one of them, you know, I, I, I like there, we, the misbehavior of men is well documented. Yeah. Yeah. And if we yeah. could, just, yeah. If, Go if ahead. we could give ourselves a moment to just question again, going back to these six principles, like it's not a finger wagging. You got to follow all these principles. <laughs> it's it's you can gauge your own behavior. Am I doing am I checking all six boxes? Am I checking two or three? Am I checking none? And it's like being on a diet like you can be on a great diet, but you can cheat every once in a while and, and eat a pizza. So these six principles are not are not like you must follow these there. Are, are you following these? Because if you're not, 
maybe look at your own behavior and question yourself. Great guides, great guides on your human sexuality. Oh, I missed one of the six. Oh, that's why my relationships aren't working or my sexuality. Oh, that's so powerful because we need guides. We do. You know, you're and a plumber, right? You need to learn how to fix pipes. That's probably a bad analogy, but you get what I'm saying. I do. I do. I do. I think that I think for men, it's for men in particular, it's really important to have guides and have practical applications of those guides and, and to be able to say, yeah, let me compare. There's a lot of comparison that I, you know, again, that could go down a negative route. But if I'm looking at my behavior and I have a framework that I can say, hey, you know what? This framework suggests that if I do these things that I that I probably will be happier, healthier, what have you. Well, now I have something that I can gauge my behavior against as opposed to just making stuff up in my yeah. mind and having nothing to compare it to. Well, <laughs> we're running out of time. I can't believe we flew through 27 <laughs> minutes. I knew we would because it's so unique. Mm. But, you know, I do have this question. I always like to ask is somebody in the audience, male or female, are asking, I love what you're saying, Jesse, but what's my first step? What What's going to get me in this journey of being better humans, having a better human sexuality? Well, I appreciate that question. And I think it's a great question. And that's why I have these uh, two hours a week uh, open conversation. Anyone can join. Uh, if you go to my website, jessepopic.com and go to the facilitation page, uh, there are uh, Zoom links. You can, anyone can join us. It's open to men and women. And I think that's the first step. The first step is, is being willing to even begin to answer the question for yourself, what is sexual health and well-being? And if you're willing to ask that question of yourself, well, now you've opened up the door and we can talk for 27 minutes or 27 hours because this is this is good stuff. I mean, the, the, the floodgates will open, so to speak. I got to be honest, I jumped on this going, this is, like I said, my first sexuality podcast. And you blew my you blew my head off. This is so much. I got notes here, and that's so simple. Just jump on a Zoom, and I love that you're doing that, Jesse, because it's got to be simple. This is a hard subject. If you make it hard to get into that journey, it's like people go, "Oh, porn! Oh, my son does porn. He does porn, and he masturbates to porn. And it's not a big deal. Well, it can be a huge deal, just like drinking or drug. You know, it could lead to some not so good results. How can people get a hold of you? besides your website. So yeah, the web the website is an easy way to get a hold of me. There's okay. contact, you can contact me there multiple ways. Uh, the email address, if you want to reach out to me directly is you, Y-O-U, at jessepopic.com, J-E-S-S-E-P-O-P-P-I-C-K.com. Uh, the website, if you go to the website, uh, you'll, have, you'll have, yeah, there's everything you need is there. Uh, I'm on Instagram at jessepopic.com. I'm on uh, TikTok at jessepopic.com. Um, and I, a lot of the content that I'm putting out raises up these questions and talks about these six, six principles of sexual health and asks the question, yeah, what does sexual health mean to you? What does sexual well-being mean to you? And, and let's just, let's facilitate these conversations. Let's talk about this stuff. Yeah. And I'm going to put this out there. I don't usually do this in a podcast. If you're interested in backing him on his book, I don't know many books like this. This could be a game changer in society. Really can. Um, can wow. We talk about everything else because we don't talk about sex. And if we do, it's in a movie and it's fake and it's, you know, uh, I'm not even talking about porn. I mean, it's you know, an R-rated movie and people are laying in bed and, you know, all that stuff that happens. But uh, conversations are powerful. They are game Well, I'm questions. getting goosebumps hearing you say that. I, I appreciate you for saying that. And, and I think for men, especially, like, I, I every man that I speak with one-on-one -on -one or even in small groups, like, people are usually willing to talk about this. If, if, if I can show some vulnerability of myself, I imagine you will as well. And there's a lot of topics that we could be talking about. There's a lot of social ills and, and maybe healthy sexuality is, seems like the last thing to talk about, but I do think it permeates all the other areas of our lives. Yeah, no, I love it. And, and audience, as I always say, this show, especially kind of say that a lot, but this one's unique. Use the four and reverse buttons on your podcast platform or on YouTube. Uh, we're old enough, me and Jesse, that there was the VHS tapes and they had to push a button, go back and forth. <laughs> but here's the power of it. We would love to have you watch this whole show or listen to the whole show. But just the six, I call them pillars, or the six things that he said that I wrote down. You might want to go back and forth to make sure you get them right and watch and listen or watch this over and over again. I believe that's the power of podcasting. We're here to change people's lives. Whatever me, my one person might be 100. We don't care. Me and Jesse would love for you to watch or listen to the whole show. But if we made an impact in somebody's life, game changer, absolute game changer. 
And the nice thing, it's a win for everybody. So let's keep moving forward. Don't forget about my TV show. Together we serve every Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern. It's on uh, Apple TV, Roku, all those streaming services. And hey, how about wearing, doing business with a service hard on your chest or your head? Hats, hoodies, T-shirts. Let's spread the message like Jesse's doing with human sexuality of this servant's heart, helping people and it'll be a better world. And as I always say, me and Jesse, thank you. Thank you so much for watching and listening to Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. Thank you all.